I was a very typical middle class teenager. I had a stable family, and I, I'm sharing this information with you because I was not a drug addled prostitute. I, I'm neither drug addled nor prostitute. <laughs> uh, I had a stable, secure family where I was loved. My father was a businessman, my mother was a college professor. They had a long term, again, stable marriage. When I was 17 uh, and I was dating my first boyfriend, I became pregnant in the fall of my senior year. I was, you know, one of those middle class college bound kids. Uh, an interesting sidelight that maybe also reflects those times is uh, I, I missed a period and got a little concerned and then I missed another period but I reassured myself that I couldn't possibly be pregnant. Remember, this is a 17 year old, because I, I knew pregnant women had these large bellies. And my sex education at that point was so limited that I didn't kind of put together that, that babies actually grow and gradually, your stomach gets there. When I finally figured out that I was indeed pregnant. I was in an absolute panic. I spoke to my boyfriend and begged him, he was five years older than I was, to marry me. He was not willing to do that. I was very aware and connected during my pregnancy and I think this is another thing that maybe, I don't know if it was true for everyone, it certainly was true for I was aware of my daughter. I talked to her constantly. I rubbed my belly. When I felt her movement inside my body, it moved me to tears. But I was in this real pickle because at that time, if one was not married, you couldn't be a mother. It just, you, it couldn't happen. So I arranged to graduate from high school early, got myself two jobs and tried to convince my boyfriend that if he would marry me, then I could be self-sufficient and support myself and the baby and he wasn't, he wasn't buying it. <laughs> and he was probably a lot more realistic than I was at that point. No one but my boyfriend knew I was pregnant. No one. No members of my family, none of my friends. No one, and I managed to disguise this because at that time fashion was on my side, and, and ball tent dresses and moo moo type dresses were in style, and I was able to disguise my pregnancy. Um, when I was about six months pregnant, my parents discovered that I was in fact pregnant, and they immediately took over and went into protective mode. And, and I, again, have to, I was gonna say remind you, but I'm guessing for most of you, this was so long ago that it's not a reminder, it's more a history lesson. <laughs> that uh, at that time, any young woman who became pregnant, who engaged in any kind of, uh, who engaged in sexual relationships was a slut. It was pretty straightforward. That's what if you were smart. And the child that you were carrying was also labeled negatively. That child was a bastard. I mean, we don't even hear that name much anymore, do we? I hope not. Anyway, my parents immediately went into protective mode for both me and their grandchild. The next day, I was shipped off to a uh, home that served as like a way station till a place opened up in the uh, maternity home where I did housework and childcare. I was only there about a week. Okay, that whole maternity home system, which was very much in play and where most women of my era ended up, 
was interesting in and of itself. It was built around secrecy and maintaining complete secrecy. So for instance, we lived dormitory style in a, in a large building that had a hospital unit on the top, a delivery room on the top floor. So everything, unless there were big medical complications happened in house. Um, to protect the secrecy. None of us, we were not allowed to share our last names and there was, there were big consequences. I can't remember one, I just remember the looming cloud. If you actually told anyone your name. And um, <laughs> the extent they went to maintain the secrecy, this home that I was in is in Pasadena, it was the Salvation Army home. I was writing letters to family and friends, and they would put them in another envelope, mail them to another Salvation Army home in Texas, and then mail them from there. So they had a Texas postmark and address, and then family and friends who wrote to me would be writing to that. I mean, it was pretty incredible. Um, I was at a even in the maternity home that no one was taking my baby away from me. I, I uh, was getting weekly visits from a social worker and the social, and they were pounding me. And, and I, I truly feel like in retrospect, I, I was producing a wanted commodity at that point. Uh, I was incredibly selfish. They had this perfect family that wanted my baby and could provide everything that I was not capable of providing. And how could I be so incredibly selfish? That in and of itself was proof of my deficiency as a mother. And I was 17. Um, so eventually I agreed took a while, but eventually I agree. Um, and I want to tell you about the birth because that was part of the whole experience. I was totally unprepared for what, what a birth actually is. I kind of had this picture in my mind. They did nothing to educate us. I mean, they had this dormitory full of pregnant teenage girls. They did nothing to educate us or prepare us in any way for these births. So my water broke. I went upstairs. I kind of thought, you know, I better get up there because, you know, baby might fall out. That would be terrible. Got up there and was in labor for approximately, unmedicated labor for approximately 24 hours. I didn't know if I was dying. I didn't know if my baby was dying. I experienced something that, a level of pain that I had never experienced before in my life. And um, a Salvation Army worker sat in the room and read me Bible verses about sin. So, and, I, and again, I'm sharing this with you because I think this was pretty typical of, of experiences, young women my age had. Um, so when, when my baby was born, and they forgot to cover the mirror, so I actually watched her birth, which was, if you've ever been present in the birth, it's, it, it's a pretty intense and amazing experience. They immediately took her away, refused to let me look at her or touch her. She was put into the, they had a nursery area up there, so I, I had to stay there, I think, for three days, and I was allowed to look at her through glass, but I was not allowed to touch her or have any when I signed the uh, final papers, they promised me that I, they would update me about how I could call and find out how she was doing, how the transition went. Um, I, I had a regular schedule that I was permitted to call on. When I made the first phone call, I was told, you just need to forget about this get on with your life and move forward. Um, in other words, I was lied to. 
Uh, so I went on, I went to college and to graduate school. I'm married. Uh, I had four children. And I, and I think in many ways, I, I feel pretty good about my life. I think that, you know, I look like one of those parents, the families that are in the books, that are <laughs> so stable and upstanding. But this continued. This, oh, the depth of this loss for me influenced who I am in such incredibly deep ways. Uh, 24 years after my daughter was born, and um, I, I use the word surrender because that's what it felt like to me. I didn't feel like I was relinquishing her. I felt like I was surrendering to an enormous amount of pressure. Um, I was pregnant with my fourth child within my marriage. And I had had the three that I had had previously when, uh, that I had raised were all cesarean sections. And I had learned a lot about birth and birth practices, and I really wanted to try to have a vaginal birth with uh, my youngest son. So 24 years after surrendering my daughter, I went into labor. Um, we got to the to the uh, point where I was pushing. My other kids were there, my husband, my mother. And I was completely dilated, and the baby's head was visible. And they said, oh my God, we can see his head. Look, there's his head. And all of a sudden, he went back up. And the doctor said to me, no, push. You're pushing with the wrong part of your body. I thought I was cooperating, and I spent three hours trying to push that baby out. It was pretty exhausting and pretty painful, and each time he would come out, they'd see the top of his head, everyone get all excited, and then I couldn't seem to complete that last push. Afterwards, I was talking to my husband, um, who knows me better than anyone in the big surprise after all these years. And I said, you know that, like, I just didn't condition my body. I was older at that point. And clearly something I didn't do with, it, you know, to get my muscles in shape to do the necessary physical work to, to uh, push Jesse out. And he looked at me and he just said, are you serious? Do you remember what happened to the last baby you pushed out? Oh my God. I was totally unconscious. Totally unconscious. So that's really my story. I, I think the thing that I wanted to share with everyone is that for all of us who are part of this constellation, for those of us who surrender children, we're dealing with loss. For those children that we surrender, they are dealing with loss. For those families, those parents, and those families that they became a part of, those adopted families are dealing with loss, with the recognition that they were not able to do what usually is their first choice. And, and granted, that's a generality and it may not be true for all families, but usually adoption is not the first go-to solution for people who are building families. So I, I mean, it is my hope that we can all come together and support our children. I guess that's